the board for Coastal Pelagics, I'll call us to order. My name is Joe Cimino. I am the um, administrative commissioner for the state of New Jersey. Uh, we've got uh, some important presentations on both uh, species that we need to go through today. Um, not a lot of tough decisions, but some stuff that'll carry us through the next few years. So if we can get started, I'll ask if there's any uh, additions or edits to the agenda. Seeing none, I'll consider the agenda approved. Um, and a, approval of the proceedings from our last meeting in November. Any edits or concerns with the proceedings as presented? We'll consider those approved as well. Um, we'll move to public comment. Not seeing any? Very good. Uh, we'll move to approval of the FMP review and state compliance reports for COVID. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, everyone. I'm Chelsea Tui, for those of you who don't know me, and I'm going to be filling in for Emily here while she's out on maternity leave. And so I'm going to move through this, you know, as quickly and seamlessly as I can. There's kind of a lot to cover today. Up on the screen behind me are the elements of the FMP review that we'll be discussing. So Atlantic Cobia are currently managed through Amendment 1 to the Interstate FMP, which was approved in 2019, and Addendum 1 to Amendment 1, which was approved in 2020. Amendment 1 transitioned Atlantic Cobia to sole management by the Commission, and then Addendum 1 set the sector-specific allocations that we see today, where 96% of the total harvest quota is allocated to the recreational sector, and 4% of the total harvest quota is allocated to the commercial sector. The total harvest quota for fishing years 2021 through 2023 is about 80,000 fish. And so for the commercial fishery, along with size limits and possession limits, the commercial commercial harvest from non-de minimis states is tracked throughout the season and the fishery closes if those landings reach the closure trigger. And then 4% of that commercial quota is set aside for de minimis states. So for the recreational fishery, in addition to size and possession limits, the recreational quota is allocated to state harvest targets. Those are soft targets for non-de minimis states and states will evaluate their average landings against their harvest target during the specifications process. So that will happen this year between this meeting and the October meeting. And then the states will adjust measures if they've exceeded their targets over the past three years. 1% of the recreational quota is designated for de minimis harvest and states with recreational de minimis status can either adopt the same measures as the nearest non-de minimis state or they can simply implement a 33 inch fork length or 37 inch total length size limit and then a one fish per vessel limit. So for status of the stock, the recent, the most recent stock assessment for Atlantic Cobia was CDAR 58, which was completed in 2020. And that assessment had a terminal year of 2017. That assessment found Atlantic Cobia was not overfished and overfishing was not occurring. The next CDAR assessment is tentatively scheduled for 2025 with a terminal year of 2023 or 2024. And this new assessment may inform 2026 or 2027 quotas and management measures. And you'll hear a little bit more about that stock assessment later today from our TC chair. And then as a quick reminder to everyone, the Atlantic Cobia stock extends from Georgia northward. So Cobia in Florida waters are considered part of the Gulf of Mexico stock, which is not managed by the commission. In 2022, total landings were 1.96 million pounds with 3.8% of that coming from the commercial sector and 96.2% of that coming from the recreational sector. 2022 landings were a 27% decrease from 2021. On the commercial side of that, landings were 75,418 pounds representing a 13% increase from 2021. And again, on the commercial side, Virginia and North Carolina landed the largest amount of that total, with Virginia representing 51% of the landings and North Carolina representing 43% of the landings. The total non-de minimis landings from Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina did reach the commercial closure trigger this year. So the fishery was closed from December 16th through the end of the calendar year. In 2022, recreational landings were 1.9 million pounds or just under 70,000 fish, representing a 28% decrease by weight from 2021. 
By number, Virginia landed 57% of that total and North Carolina landed 18% of that total. Um, and just in general, recreational harvest has widely fluctuated over the time series with some rapid increases and decreases. For the whole time series from 1981 forward, the average recreational harvest is about 1.1 million pounds per year. But in more recent years, the fishery has grown with an average harvest of 2.1 million fish per year for the past 10 years. In 2022, we were slightly below average with 1.9 million pounds. And then again, in general, recreational releases have generally increased, but they decreased in 2022 relative to 2021, where 189,608 recreationally caught fish were released. This decrease in discards this year can be tied to the decrease in recreational landings in 2022. Over the last five years, from 2018 to 2022, an average 77% of cobia caught recreationally were released alive each year. This is higher than the average of 65% released alive during the previous five-year period from 2013 to 2017. So the figure behind me just shows commercial and recreational landings in pounds for Atlantic cobia. You can see that the commercial landings are a pretty small proportion of the total landings and then decreased recreational landings in 2022 compared to 2021 and 2020. So for the state compliance reports this year and the FMP review, the plan review team found no inconsistencies from the FMP with a few notes that are included in the following slides. In 2022, no states implemented changes to recreational cobia measures and de minimis states changed their measures to either adopt Virginia's measures, which is the nearest non-de minimis state, or they adopted the standest de minimis measure. So for recreational de minimis, 1% of the recreational quota is designated to account for harvest in de minimis states. A state qualifies for recreational de minimis status if recreational harvest in two of the previous three years is less than 1% of the annual coastwide recreational landings during that time. Rhode Island, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, and Florida all requested recreational de minimis status, and all of these states meet the recreational de minimis qualifications except for Maryland. In their compliance report, Maryland noted variability in landings from year to year, so they were just over that 1% threshold in 2020, and then they had zero landings in 2022. Given this, Maryland requested to continue under recreational de minimis status for another year until 2023 recreational harvest can be evaluated. And the plan review team did agree with this rationale. For commercial de minimis, de minimis states are not required to monitor their commercial landings during the season. The qualifications for commercial de minimis status is commercial landings in two of the previous three years that are less than 2% of the coastwide commercial landings for the same time period. Rhode Island, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, Georgia, and Florida all requested commercial de minimis status, and they all meet the qualifications this year. So the PRT recommends that the board approve all de minimis requests, including Maryland's, as the PRT agrees with the provided rationale that I just discussed. The PRT emphasized that multiple states could exceed de minimis thresholds over the next few years, particularly if cobia landings continue to increase in mid-Atlantic states. The PRT notes the management implications of this, including requiring commercial in-season monitoring in more states and adding new states to the allocation of recreational quota. Also, the PRT notes that the current allocation of recreational quota to each state is based on landings data through only 2015, which may need to be updated to reflect more recent years. As the board considers potential management action with setting new specifications and with the new stock assessment, the PRT recommends that the board discuss whether updates to the state-by-state -state recreational harvest allocations are warranted. And there's going to be a presentation later on today specifically aimed at recreational allocations. So stay tuned for that. So the last comment from the PRT is that the PRT noted New York's recent Cobia commercial landings were 6.9% of the commercial landings in 2020, 2.6% in 2021, and 2% 2 in 2022. Based on those years, the PRT recommends that New York declare an interest in Atlantic Cobia 
and depending on future landings in season commercial monitoring may be needed need to be considered in the future um, I believe that New York has completed the process to update their regulations and they now meet the FMP requirements for the commercial fishery and they're in the process of updating their regulations to meet the recreational fishery requirements but they still do not have a declared interest in the fishery I'm sure New York can speak more to what they're in the process of doing but I also believe that they're in the process of implementing regulations for closure authority for closure authority. Next slide, please. So that concludes the FMP review presentation and I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you so much, Chelsea. Questions for Chelsea? I see, I got Chris Bat Savage and then Jay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for the presentation, Chelsea. Uh, I should know this, so I apologize for asking, but um, in, in the case of Maryland where they, you know, fallen out of de minimis and, and I support keeping them in de minimis uh, uh, status for now. Does, does the FMP have a mechanism for a state that kind of no longer qualifies for de minimis for the recreational fisheries uh, to you know, set up their own regs or is that gonna kind of force looking at reallocation since they don't have you know, a, a, their own you know, amount for their state? Yeah, thank you for that question. So the FMP states that if a state falls out of de minimis, we would need an addendum to calculate them into the recreational allocation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks, Chelsea. Um, a really good presentation. So I, I had a question. One of the slides, and, and I can't remember now if it said non-de minimis or de minimis, but there was a closure like in December um, and so I guess my question was, how does, when that closure happens, like how do we know? Is there like a notification that occurs as a commission contact? Um, everyone, I just want to make sure that we are paying attention and, and uh, note those closures when they happen. Yes, thank you for the question. That closure is for the commercial fishery and the commission, I believe, sends out a memo to all of the states um, once the trigger has reached, I'm going to phone a friend to Tony here. And Jay, it's a 30-day notice to try to, when we developed a plan for the states that were not de minimis, 30 days was enough time for every state to close. Um, de minimis states are also supposed to close. Um, not all de minimis states have been closing when we send that notification letter. And to follow up to Chris's question earlier, the Commercial measures, when you fall out of, um, no, are, are no longer de minimis. And you don't, we don't need to alter those. That state can just automatically fall into those measures. Um, so we don't have to make a change for those. Other questions, Erica? Just a question for Tony. Florida is a de minimis state. Um, is Florida ex Without um, Atlantic Cobia in our waters, is Florida expected to announce a closure of our waters for Atlantic Cobia? No, you are not. You're not considered a harvester of the Atlantic Cobia. Thank you. Go ahead, John. Thanks, Joe. And, uh, Thank you, Chelsea, for the presentation and for picking up for Emily. Um, I didn't know if this was the time for New York to just kind of give an update on where it's at. Yeah, please. Uh, so, so as Chelsea noted, uh, as of August 16th, our re recreational regulations will match the de minimis standard. We are working towards uh, regulatory, regulatory, regulatory authority to close commercial cobia. Um, and uh, I mean, we do have uh, the capacity to track landings. I just don't know what, what frequency um, those landings reports have to be submitted to ASMFC. So in terms of the frequency over the summer, we typically ask for reporting every week. And then as we get closer to that commercial trigger, we'll ask for more frequent reports, sometimes two times a week, sometimes that's every other day. It depends on how close we are to that trigger. Other questions? Go ahead, John. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, not so much a question, but a comment. Um, John, if you want to talk to some of the non de minimis states about how we're doing those reporting requirements and meeting those for the weekly updates that we need to provide to ASMFC, we're happy to help because we had to put some different regulations in place to make sure that we could meet those weekly reporting requirements. Okay. And if no other questions, um, I'll be looking for a motion for the uh, FMP reviews here. Uh, Dr. Rhodes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'd move to approve the Atlantic Cobia FMP uh, review for fishing year 2020, uh, the state compliance reports and the de minimis requests um, with the noted um, provisions. Um, and I guess since we have it up, so I will move to approve the Atlantic Cobia FMP review for 2020 fishing year, the state compliance reports and de minimis requests for Rhode Island, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, Georgia, and Florida. Thank you, Dr. Rhodes. Lynn, is that a second? Second by Lynn Fagley, thank you. Okay, any discussion on this motion? Go ahead, Roy. It's not on the motion, Mr. Chair, but if you'll indulge me just a second. Um, I'm pretty sure I heard that if, if a state goes out of de minimis uh, categorization, that a uh, an addendum is needed to add them to the plan. Isn't that something we can do by uh, a vote of the policy board rather than have to go through the trouble of, of preparing an addendum for that? So I'll start us off with it. We may have a host of answers here. For one, you know, uh, out of de minimis, so this is for recreational, where we, because we have averages, it, it kind of has balanced out in the recent past. Um, it, it's kind of gotten us to this point. We need to have a discussion on what happens next because the states that aren't in de minimis have soft targets that are actually quite old right now. Um, and so, you know, I think we will be discussing in, in just a little bit what it looks like for our future. Um, but whether or not, if we had to, in the meantime, through before we got to a final addendum, um, have policy board discuss this, I'll turn that over. Looks like Tony's ready. So, Roy, I missed the first half of your question, but are, you're talking about relative to the policy, the, the policy that the policy board implemented this last year, is that in reference to, or are you just saying, should the policy board tell this board to allocate? I was hoping to streamline the process. It, it just seems to me that because of climate change and shifting stocks, these types of discussions are gonna come up repeatedly where fish distribution changes. And, and it seems to me a more nimble response on our part would be to take administrative action that to add a state to a species board rather than go through the addendum process every time that happens. You don't need to um, go through an addendum process to add a state to a species board. The addendum process is to bring them into the allocation uh, how, of how you have adopted management for this species. So there's a difference there. Um, the board, a state can just declare interest into a species board. Once they declare interest, then the next time that species board meets, there would be some discussion of, of allocation, including them in the allocation, wouldn't there? Yes, and then uh, I think there will be additional discussion here today about the allocations for these species. And, you know, because this is a species that we know is highly impacted by climate change, you know, I think that the species board should take into consideration that states may be needing to move in. And so the way we set up allocation for this stock should be in a nimble, responsive way to uh, changing climate conditions. But I'm not sure it's something that you would want the policy board to design for you all. Yeah, I think we, you know, we put ourselves in a spot with with uh, the soft targets and, and, you know, we learned from quite a few species that not revisiting these types of allocations for a number of years is also a challenge. So again, we'll have that discussion soon. I saw Lynn's hand up. 
Oh, Lynn's good. Okay. Anyone else? Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, just picking up quickly on, on Roy's point, um, I think it's a good one and kind of thinking it through a little bit. So I get the need for a process because we're talking about allocations. It's kind of like, you know, weighty. Um, so I kind of understand the need for a process. However, I think about, you know, impacts of climate change and, and conceivably what could happen, for instance, with a state like Maryland, they could like, you know, hit that threshold, kind of come in and then drop back out, you know, drop back below. So the, what I'm getting at is climate change, usually the hallmark is variability. So you could have these situations where you're kind of popping in and, and popping out. And, and I think that speaks to Roy's point of having a kind of a nimble process might be valuable for the states that are kind of on the edge and, and are going to pop in and, and pop out. So I'm, I'm not suggesting anything right now other than to kind of um, it might be worth thinking through, um, you know, maybe there's some um allocation purgatory that you go into in, in the short term and then once you have like consistently stayed above the threshold for a number of years you know then you sort of go into the full allocation scheme or there there may be designs that can you know accommodate the variability um better than than others so i'll stop rambling <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. And that's, I, I don't think it is. And, and we have some time on the agenda today to to start those discussions. I, I had asked for that because I think it's it's good to have some discussions even prior to a stock assessment, right? I mean, we're, I think timing-wise, we should be eventually reacting to that before we get to final decisions. But I think it makes a lot of sense to start start this discussion even before that that happens. And so we'll we'll move into that agenda item shortly. But um, and and so I, I, not to cut anyone off here, but I think because we we will pick up that discussion in just a minute. Unless there's um, anything else, we can move into the the harvest quotas uh, um, for 2024 through 2026. And I can turn that over to. Uh, oh, sorry, we didn't. We switched discussions, huh? I, uh, well, let, let me say this. If, if we're done with discussion on the motion at hand, Robert's rules, folks, um, if, it, unless I see hands, I'll, I'm going to ask if there's any objections to the motion. Okay, great. There we go. Now we can dispense of, of that very simple motion and um, we'll move on. So um, uh, turn this over to uh, Andrew. And and uh, to Chelsea, I'm not sure who's going to start us off. Okay, to Angela. Thank you. Okay, slide is up. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Angela Giuliano, and I represent Maryland on the technical committee. Um, as the current technical committee chair, I'll be presenting our recommendations uh, for the COBIA harvest quota for 2024 through 2026. Um, as Chelsea mentioned in her presentation, I'm sure you'll be seeing a lot of this today. Um, the current harvest quota is currently is set at 80,112 fish, um, and it's allocated with 96% of the fish to the recreational sector and 4% to the commercial sector. Um, this works out to an allocation of 76,908 fish for the recreational sector and convert it into pounds for the commercial sector, 73,116 pounds. Um, this quota was set after the last stock assessment, which was um, approved by the board, I believe, in 2020. Um, it was based on a series of um, constant F and constant harvest projections through 2024. Um, the quota was originally set for the 2020 through 2022 time period, um, but following changes um, that occurred in Addendum 1 to reallocate the quota between the recreational and commercial sectors. Um, this quota was extended through 2023. Um, so with today's meeting, the board um, will need to set a specification for up to three years starting in 2024. 
Um, as part of these discussions, the TC initially requested updated projections from the Southeast Fisheries Science Center. Um, as part of this request, um, we wanted to update landings for 2019 to 2022 based on observed harvest. Um, and we also made the request to have projections through 2026 rather than 2024 if feasible. Um, and this was to basically try to bridge the gap between the previous projections and when we expect the next stock assessment update to be. Um, the Southeast Fisheries Science Center responded saying that the new projections would not be scientifically justified. Um, first, there was concern about the length of the projection period. Um, the previous assessment had a terminal year of 2017. Um, so updating the projections through 2026 would have resulted in a nine year projection period well beyond the five year limit that is recommended. Um, secondly, which again, we keep highlighting this part, um, there's been a shift in the where the majority of removals have been occurring, in re, especially in recent years since 2018, um, with the majority of the removals now outside of the South Atlantic. Um, and this is inconsistent with the projection model that's been used by the Science Center. So because the harvest levels um, in the projections were similar to the harvest levels that have been observed and the previous projections had relatively flat trends over time, um, the Science Center suggested that it's likely that any new projection runs would provide similar advice to what we had before um, through 2024. Um, so the Science Center had recommended extending the current quotas. Um, after this response was received, um, the Technical Committee met again um, and agreed with the Science Center's um, discussion about recent landings. Um, so the average between 2019 and 2022, the average harvest observed has been 2.2 million pounds which is less than the 2.4 million pounds of harvest assumed in those projections that were completed before and are the projections that the current quote is based on. Um, and between those years, only 2021 has had a harvest above the values assumed in the projections. So given the lack of new information um, without an updated assessment at this point or updated projections, uh, the fact that the realized harvest on average has been below the amount previously assumed in the projections. Um, and lastly, that the projected probability of the stock being overfished in 2024 was quite low. Um, the technical committee recommends that the board set the quota for the 2024 to 2026 fishing years as the status quo level of 80,112 fish. Um, and I put up here again the recreational and commercial quota for how that's allocated out. Um, and with the stock assessment assumed to be completed, hopefully sometime late in 2025, we recommend that this be set for three years. Um, I did want to bring to the board's attention some preliminary discussions going on about the next stock assessment um, and the data needs. Um, so at our last, oops, so we don't change the slide. There we go. Um, so as I said, the not, next stock assessment is scheduled to be an update assessment, um, but there have been a lot of changes in data availability and catch since the last assessment, and it's likely that there will be some changes in the modeling approach and methods used, so it won't be the straight usual update. Um, regarding data challenges, um, the previous assessment only had one abundance index that was based on the Southeast Region Headboat Survey, um, and even at that time, the index while the terminal year of the assessment went through 2017, the index only went through 2015. And this was due to season closures occurring in 2016 and 17 that made the index not comparable in those years. Um, additionally, since that time with COVID, um, there's been some additional changes with fewer head boats in the fishery. Um, secondly, as mentioned before, there's been a change in where landings are coming from. Um, so, with the continued expansion of landings into Virginia and North. Um, so the shift basically means that there'll need to be a full reconsideration of the data available, as well as the analytical methods needed, um, and likely to be data sources from outside the Southeast region will be required. Um, and these new data sources will come from both state, probably likely come from both state and federal partners. Um, so while historically in the past, the Southeast Fishery Science Center has taken the lead on these assessments with the changes in data sources and catch, um, 
the intention is to have more of a collaborative effort between the Southeast Fishery Science Center and ASMFC for the next stock assessment um, with the eventual formation of a COBIA stock assessment subcommittee. Um, and as part of our last technical committee call, states have been tasked essentially with starting to compile their state data sets that may be useful for future assessment work. So this includes the carcass collection programs, which is historically where we've gotten a lot of the biological data, such as ages, lengths, and maturity information. It may include logbook data, um, as well as recreational reporting programs and tagging data. Um, you know, and I think at this point, any data sources that states feel could be, or federal partners feel could be useful, I think would be definitely considered at this point. Um, so the goal basically would be to have the data sets assembled by the end of this year or early next year to start preparing for the assessment. Um, and while the exact assessment schedule is still being worked out, um, like I said, the goal is approximately fall of 2025, but we would hope that it would be completed early enough in 25 that it could be used to inform the 2026 harvest specification process. And so with that, that is my presentation. So I don't if I can take any questions at this point. Thank you, Angela. Well done. And I'd like to extend that thanks to the entire TC. Um, questions? Go ahead, Lynn. Yeah, thank you, Angela, very much for that. I'm just a little bit curious about the assessment and the word tentatively scheduled. So I think you addressed it, but I'm just kind of wondering when we when we know it's scheduled and we can stop saying tentatively scheduled. <laughs> so I think with the Science Center, they're still figuring out their assessment schedule. So by, I think, October-ish, they should know who they'll be able to assign for the fall, like to be their lead person. Um, and, you know, I think the October timeline essentially assumes that everything goes perfectly <laughs> with data collection analyses. Um, like I said, while generally you think of an update assessment as being quick and easy just to put in the old data this one is not going to be that so you know i think that october timeline is optimistic and what we're aiming for but it could be delayed a little bit depending on how things shake out yeah i was just gonna basically say what angela said we have a definitive yes we will be doing the assessment um but parts of the timeline are a little in the question mark so that comes with the tentative part of it. Uh, next hand is Osha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so is this assessment gonna go through the CDAR process? And then I do have some comments after that. Yes, so Tony says that it will be going through the CDAR process. Okay, great. Um, and if if you'll indulge me, I just want to make a couple of comments towards the assessment. Um, I think, and I do think this is something I heard that we might be discussing at the policy board tomorrow. I do have some concerns given the fact that um, we've lost some really good assessment power um, in the southern region. So um, forming a SAS gives me a little bit of a stomach ache, just uh, recognizing that it's going to be really hard for us to form a SAS. I think that those of us that do have stock assessment scientists in the southern region, um, they're pretty strapped on the assessments that we've been putting them on. Um, so I, I'm glad to hear that the center, I, you know, the original letter that I read said that the center really was kind of out on helping overall. Um, so I'm glad to hear that they are willing to donate some assessment power um, to the COBIA stock assessment. But, um, you know, we're running into a problem where we can't make projections anymore using the old model. Um, we're extending, um, and I feel safe in what we're doing today, we're extending our quotas out. Um, but it's definitely a concern. I, I you know, in, in hearing things, I think the 2025 timeline is pretty optimistic. Um, and I'd just like to maybe draw some attention to all of us at the board level to give some consideration to um, what this means if we're going to form a SAS for COBIA and the, um, you know, the staff that we'll need in order to help man that committee. So um, just some thoughts there that I wanted to share. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, um, those species that used to share a board with these two um, 
are are in the works right now and, and dealing with some stuff. Um, and you know the range is expanded for this species, and and maybe that means that the uh, assessment power should too. You know, just because a species is data poor doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of work going into the assessment. So. Um, <clears throat> Uh, it's actually probably all the more reason for for maybe some northern states to be participating. It may not be their long-running surveys that are what's going to get us through to management advice. Um, Tony, did you have anything to add? Joe, I was just going to say I think it's you know it's, it is important that we have a SAS to help support the science center um, because of the range expansion that we're seeing, and that will mean that we need some of these de minimis states to probably participate in that in order to help understand the data that they have, um, what we're seeing, um, and that, you know, the Science Center has even brought up the fact that maybe we should be looping in the Northeast Fisheries Science Center in addition because of that range expansion that we're seeing. So um, we hear you, but we also want to make sure that we support the Science Center with the states in order to get this new information into the assessment. Otherwise, it may not get in there. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, um, so thinking about um, the, so Angela, you had suggested that, uh, like if it's originally kind of on there as an update, uh, but it sounds like maybe there's it's going to be kind of benchmarky or research track, I should say that. Um, so, like, is that fair? Like, can it change to like a, a more robust? Um, it, you know, it sounds like well, maybe it could use it. Number one, um, and then the. I, I, so I'll, I'll stop there. I'm just wondering if if it might be a you know more robust assessment than just an update, which is probably good. Let's turn to John. Yeah, since we were, I'm on the CDAR steering committee at least, and we have talked about this some, and I think it's good what the commission is doing to form the stock assessment subcommittee and to bring the people that know that data from beyond the Southeast region more involved in this assessment, because that is one of the challenges is these species shift that those in the Southeast and at the center are really well-versed in how the Southeast data sets come together but they can be different in how data are done, how surveys are done, even as we saw with this frustrating stock, how the MRIP average catch is estimated between the two regions. So I think that part's really critical. Um, and all of those things are kind of tied up with the centers backing off a little bit in terms of the overall support and leading of this assessment, but still willing to provide that critical assessment expertise which is hopefully manpower on the stock assessment subcommittee for running the model with the support of y'all's state folks and hopefully the Northeast Center to look into other surveys and other ways of getting the data together. And, you know, with all of that that's going on, I think it's pretty clear and based on what we heard from the Science Center that just a, a simple update is not appropriate for this stock. <clears throat> I'm not sure if it needs to go to full benchmark slash research track, and I say slash because the research track is kind of on the chopping block potentially. The steering committee is looking at moving back toward benchmarks because research tracks have not lived up to the promise. They've taken a lot of time, they've not increased productivity, but yet they've not also not really increased transparency and in the quality of the product. So I think if you felt that your your stock assessment subcommittee maybe needed some additional assistance or your technical committee needed some additional higher level assistance in terms of like peer review, then you might want to consider benchmark because that's one of the key differences between say doing an update that you can look into a lot of things on and doing a full on benchmark. Um, I think obviously when you go to the full on benchmark, you're a lot more time involved. So, I'm, I'm hoping that the technical committee and stock assessment subcommittee feels like, you know, they're they're capable of reviewing whatever comes out of this as an operational, with maybe looking at some additional indices and and looking at some new data coming in from the northeast, and at least above the South Atlantic, Mid Atlantic boundaries to fill in some of the data gaps that we're seeing as things like the headboat survey drop off from the south. So, but I think there is some leeway, and probably the commission in this group could could have the final say much as we do at the council as to whether or not you really feel like you need a, a full benchmark with something that, you know, 
it's going to take more time, which I don't think anybody wants. Thank you, John. Do we have other? Jeff Kalen? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thanks for the presentation, Angela. It was, it was excellent. Could you go back a couple more slides to the 2024 quota? Uh, breakdown. My question has to do with the conversion factor between pounds and um, fish, uh, because I think the recreational was in fish and the commercial was in pounds. So I'm just curious what the conversion factor is, because I'm trying to figure out what the allocation formula is between rec and commercial for the fishery in, with those projections. Yeah, so I believe, Chelsea, you can correct me if I'm wrong, the cur current uh, weight for the commercial fishery is, is from the average from 2015 to 17 commercial weights to convert it from numbers of fish to pounds? I would have to double check on that. Okay. Um, I'm not 100% positive. but I think it's check. a three-year average weight no, to yeah. convert the commercial quota from numbers of fish to pounds I think is based on 2015 through 17 commercial data. All right. Well, I don't need to know it right this second. Yeah, but it I'm works out, curious. I believe, to like 28 pounds or so. 22, 28. So what is the allocation breakdown between rec and commercial? for the So fishery? in numbers of fish, it's the 96%, um, 4%. 96%, Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm kind and of that happens in numbers of fish, and then they use an average weight to convert it into pounds for the commercial sector. Okay, well, I can go back and look at the document more carefully. I think, I think Chelsea has math. it up, actually. That's that's good. <laughs> Sorry to slow things down there, Joe, but okay, well, I get back to you. Just trying to do the math in my head, that's all. No, thank you, Jeff. It's an important question. I mean, some of this stuff was was done a while back and hasn't been revisited. It was, a, you know, the the board's decision to to deal with rec targets and numbers of fish was a was a big decision. It's it's not something typically done here at the commission, but we felt it was very important. You know, we I think right around that time the states were taking on the APIS program, and we knew that there weren't a lot of cobia being measured. And so, you know, to, to get an average weight, um, if, if you if you look at the rec estimates for this species, um, it's very interesting. I think just this past year, New York had uh, a higher weight landing than either South Carolina or Georgia, but the number of fish was, I think, half of what was landed in those states. Thank you. Any other questions on this? We, we, we do need a motion to move this forward. Go ahead, Doug. Are you ready for a motion? If there's not one prepared, I'll read. Mr. Chair, I'd move to, commit to keep the 2024-2026 total harvest quota at the status quo level of 80,112 fish, the result, this results in a recreational quota of 76,908 fish and a commercial quota of 73,116 pounds. Well said. Uh, Lynn, second? Okay. Any discussion on the motion? Go ahead, Chris. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, certainly support the motion, and uh, I think you know, the technical committee uh, you know, had gave good justification for it, and I was reminded during listening to the TC meeting that, um, that based on the projections, this was a fairly conservative uh, quota that was that was picked several years ago, which I think is important as we get further away from from that stock assessment. Um, I mean, this is pretty obvious stuff. We'll be talking about more here soon, but yeah, um, I think just for just keep in everyone's mind that I think it's easy fish move north uh, into waters where they were non-existent to now rare event species, uh, there's going to be more management uncertainty in what the, the harvest is, especially on the recreational side, where you see uh, you know, harvest estimates uh, kind of, you know, appear and disappear in, in certain states, uh, while we know anecdotally that you know, there, there might be a little more persistent, at least based on state records being set uh, on, on a fairly regular basis. Um, yeah, I think we just need to, to keep keep that in mind uh, when we you know, set set the quotas, uh, and uh, as we also talking about talk about the next agenda item. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, unfortunately, there's been a theme here that uh, we've been aboard to be dealing with, um, you know, kind of dated data. Um, 
for both species. So I think I think maybe hopefully this is a safe way forward. I see Jay's hand, but I, if it uh, if it's acceptable to the board, we do have one perfection to the motion that we would like to make, and that's move to set the quota for 2024 through 2026. Since this isn't something that we're revisiting and have already decided on. Okay. Okay. Any hands and objection to that, or are we okay with that? All right. And then I'll go to Jay. You had your hand. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, just thinking, uh, and I appreciated Chris's um, comment uh, um, about this, and, and I fully support the motion. Uh, just a comment about. So it seems as if it's not that they couldn't do projections, it's that they shouldn't do projections because we're kind of really far out from the terminal year. And I totally support that. The signals seem kind of flat. So, you know, I think um, what we're doing here um, all makes sense. The point I wanted to raise is um, we should think about that with the timing of the COBIA assessments because Right, we have we can't work with anything this year. It's not going to be there next year either. Um, so we're like a decade out or something. Like it's far, <laughs> um, and so we'll keep getting trapped in this cycle unless we can kind of think of um, you know remedying that with kind of the how far can you do a projection and have comfort and, and kind of build your stock assessment cycle from that. Go ahead, John. And I guess at some point we'll get around to instructions to the TC and whatnot as they work on this. But, you know, I think that's a really good point. And keeping up with these assessments is tough. Keeping up with them across the board for all of us is tough. This, this may be a stock that lends itself to you know, looking at is there an index or some measure that's readily available on much much more timely basis than a stock assessment that provides a good metric for how this stock is doing that could be monitored, much as you do with different data sets for those other stocks that this group used to deal with where you have like the, you know, formalized stops light approach. But there may be an index or something that is actually looks to be representative that you could keep a handle on and we wouldn't be in this situation of you know knowing you have a quota that was conservative not really knowing where the stock is going it really would be nice to have some independent information that's why i think the tc and the stock assessment committee looking at indices thinking hard about them and maybe we could challenge them to come up with something that's going to give us a metric of this stock in between stock assessments that's a lot more informative than just landings Yeah, that, no, that's a fantastic idea, John. And um, maybe so um, it could be generated at the technical committee. Another mechanism that could be used to sort of generate that type of information would be a term of reference for that um, subsequent assessment. Any other discussion on this? Well, I'll read it one more time and then I'll ask if there's any objections. So move to set the 2024 through 2026 total harvest quota at the status quo level of 80,112 fish. This results in a recreational quota of 76,908 fish and a commercial quota of 73,116 pounds. The motion was made by Mr. Hamans and seconded by Ms. Fagley. Any objection to the motion? No, that's great. Okay, and we will move forward. <clears throat> oh, motion carries unanimously, thanks, yes. Okay, so moving forward, um, We've already started this discussion a little bit, and I think it's an important one. So I'm interested to hear from uh, folks that haven't commented yet, but we'll talk about the timeline for um, potentially revisiting state allocate, reallocation or allocation and, and, you know, what exactly that might mean, because I think we've got some other ideas on the table here. So um, Chelsea, do you have something for us? OK, we'll start off with a presentation. Okay, great. And before I give the presentation, Jeff, I have that answer to your question here. It took me a second to track it down. But um, for the commercial commercial portion of the quota, the average weight is the weight from 2015 to 2017, which is 22.8 pounds. 
up. All right. I, yeah, thanks. I came up with 23 and a half pounds based on the that breakdown. So those are big fish. I just, I don't know much about those fish. So uh, appreciate the information. Great. And with that, I'll uh, move into my short presentation on recreational allocation of Atlantic cobia. Um, the information in the following slides is really just a review of what was included in the memo that went out to the board as part of the meeting materials and how we could potentially move forward with reviewing state-by-state -state allocations. Next slide, please. So in 2019, Addendum 1 to Amendment 1 allocated 96% of the total harvest quota to the recreational fishery and 4% to the commercial fishery. And then Amendment 1 was the amendment that defined the percent allocations of the recreational harvest quota to non de minimis states. So these allocations were calculated based on historical landings in number of fish, where 50% is based on the 10 year average from 2006 to 2015, and 50% is based on the five year average between 2011 and 2015. And then there's that 1% set aside for recreational landings in de minimis states. Next slide, please. So up on the screen behind me, these are the results of those allocations and the allocations that we use today, where Virginia receives a majority of that allocation for their soft target, and Georgia receives the least aside from the de minimis set aside. Next slide, please. In 2021 and 2022, as I mentioned before, the COBIA plan review team noted that the current allocation of recreational quota to each state is based on landings data through only 2015, which may need to be updated to reflect more recent years. You heard earlier in the FMP review that some states north of Virginia are at risk of falling out of re recreational de minimis status over the next several years. And then additionally, as Angela said before, in their letter responding to the Commission's request for updated COBIA projections, the Southeast Fisheries Science Center noted that recent trends evident in the MRIP data indicate that total removals of COBIA have shifted northward such that the area outside of the South Atlantic from Virginia to Massachusetts now represent a bulk of the recreational landings. So if a state does fall out of recreational de minimis, um, reallocation of the recreational harvest targets will be needed to account for the new non-de minimis state. And Amendment 1 says that this can be accomplished through an addendum to Amendment 1. And then again, so this reallocation will be needed if a state falls out of de minimis, but the board can also choose to initiate this addendum before that occurs if they wish to. And then if reallocation is desired and the process is started, Soon within the next you know, year or upcoming time board meetings, uh, it would align with that new COBIA stock assessment that has the potential to inform 2026 or 2027 measures. Uh, so over the next two slides, I'm gonna briefly go over those timelines that were presented to you all in the memo. So the first timeline starts with the board tasking the COBIA technical committee to identify recent trends in, in state and regional landings. On this timeline, in mid-2024, the board would initiate the addendum. That addendum would go out for public comment in late 2024, early 2025, with an implementation date of 2026. So the second timeline considers a 2025 implementation timeline. So this timeline begins with the same item, which is for the board to task the Cobial Technical Committee to evaluate recent trends in state and regional landings. However, here the board would initiate that addendum in early 2024 as opposed to mid-2024, and the addendum would go out for public comment by mid-2024 with an implementation date of 2025. And then after that implementation, the new 2025 stock assessment will become available again for 2026 or 2027 measures. And with that, I can take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Chelsea? We'll start with Shannon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
Chelsea, I just wanted to maybe kind of get to the thought process. So it sounds like the PRT, you know, obviously reviewed the plan and determined that even though um, Maryland was not de minimis, technically they fell out in two of the three years, they decided to allow Maryland to be de minimis. We obviously voted on all that. Um, just wanted to kind of maybe get to what the PRT's thoughts were there, considering it sort of seems like a bit of a, a band-aid that we're saying, like, let's make sure we leave Maryland de minimis because we know that we can't address this with, you know, such immediacy of trying to figure that out. Did the PRT have any thoughts about these kind of timelines um, and what they might prefer? Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, so the PRT did not talk very much about timelines. They really agreed with the rationale that was provided by Maryland, which was that they were very close to the threshold in 2020 at 1.8%, and then they had 0% in 2022. So they wanted just an extra year to evaluate what the 2023 harvest would be so they could see, get a better handle on what the recreational fishery is looking up because it's been so variable over the past three years. Um, but there wasn't very much discussion about timelines. Thank you. Other questions? No questions. Well, um, then it gets to the tough part. <laughs> so what do we, go ahead. Just a curiosity question of process while we're talking about this. And if I missed it earlier, um, John, I'm, I'm sorry. So New York, how does the timing of New York potentially declaring interest impact where we're going with a potential allocation addendum? Because some, you know, if you guys are, I'm just curious how that might play out, if anybody knows. Go ahead, Tony. Lynn, I think it depends on how the board develops the allocation plan and that's hence, you know, part of the reason why we have to be very thoughtful with this allocation plan. We know that there are states that are, I'll say, kind of rapidly coming out of de minimis. And so in order to be nimble and approach that uh, new allocate, like that we don't want to have to do an addendum every time a state comes out of de minimis probably, or I don't know, maybe you do. Um, I shouldn't speak for the board, um, but so hopefully we can develop a, an allocation plan where you can easily adapt to that versus having to change every single year. Thanks, Tony. I think that's why this discussion is important is because the motion that we're looking for is going to be tasking the TC, so we want to get that right. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Just to, to add to what Tony said, you know, just because a state declares an interest in a board doesn't guarantee them quota and a state doesn't have to be on a board to receive quota. In other words, you know, we've got examples both ways where there's states that sit on boards and they're, you know, have a, a very small share, 0.01%, I think is Pennsylvania's share of Menhaden and Maine gets a, a chunk of summer flounder, for example, they, they, they don't sit on that board. So the declared interest doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean you get something or don't get something. You know, it's all part of the deliberation moving forward and, and landings patterns and, and those sorts of things. So I think, you know, it's up to New York whether they want to participate or not, but I think they'd be fully considered based on landings history, whether they're here or not. Go ahead, John. Thank you. I'm, I mean, so I'm obviously paying attention right now and trying to wrap my head around it. I. I guess my biggest concerns when it comes to this recreational allocation issue is the volatility and variability of the landings. Uh, you know, New York had zeros. There's years where we don't catch one, according to MRIP. There's many years where we don't land any. And then in a single year, we could have 144,000 pounds worth of fish landed. So um, I don't know how that can be handled in any kind of a reasonable allocation scenario. Um, and I would hate to, you know, sea regulations um seesaw like summer you know summer flounder did once upon a time when we annually adjusted things so i'll be paying a lot of attention i i don't know uh have an answer or a solution Shannon. thanks mr chair um i i think i'd like to take this time to go ahead and make a motion because i believe that that will kind of lead us towards um conversation 
Um, my preference is for the second timeline that was presented today. Um, so I'd like to essentially make a motion towards that and then discuss my rationale on, on why I prefer that motion once I get the second, hopefully. Thanks, Jenna. Let's, let's get something that we could all look at and then um, I'll look for a second. No worries. Thank you. Um, so this motion would be to move to task the COBIA TC to develop a fishery review that characterizes the recent trends in state and regional landings compared to their harvest targets, including de minimis landings. The results of this review will inform a future addendum to be implemented for 2025 that considers recreational allocations, de minimis, and any other issues that the board identifies. It is the intent to initiate this addendum either at the commission's annual meeting or at the 2024 winter meeting. And if I get a second, I'll speak to that motion. Thank you. Okay, motions before us. And oh, wow, by the time I turned around, I'm going to go with Mel Bell and second to that motion. Go ahead, Jen. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't want to belabor this point because I think that we've had a lot of pre conversation around the table about this issue. Um, we're at a point where the landings for the species are extremely volatile. We know that states are hopping in and out of de minimis. Um, we recognize that there are some sort of range expansion where the species is starting to move farther and farther north. Um, personally, I think that the way that we have structured this fishery um, no longer works for us. Um, I don't think that a state by state allocation recreationally makes a lot of sense when we're basing that off of old MREP data that we also all recognize um, can be extremely flawed in what it's actually capturing. Um, so my intent with this motion is to make sure that we start this timeline early because we already see the problem occurring. Um, we don't really know the timeline of the assessment. I think it might be longer than we're anticipating, so I don't want to try to wait to align with the outcome of that assessment. Um, and my intent here, as we start to discuss things with the, T, uh, with the TC and eventually, hopefully, a PDT, would be to start to think about allocation um, not in a state-by-state -state way, but either in a coast-wide or a regional way, in a way that makes a bit more sense, can be a bit more responsive to how this um, species is moving, um, and ensures that we still have the access that I know that some of um, both the northern and the southern states are favoring for this species. So kind of just want to try to get everybody to a place where we all have access to a species that we recognize is expanding. Thank you. Mel, anything to add? No, I'll just say that I, I think part of uh, the thinking here too is the sort of uncertainty about the timing of the assessment. I mean, we heard, yeah, it's kind of in wet concrete or something at this point, but I, I think that's part of it. The, a downside, would be that you know you find yourself taking some actions that you're going to live with and then then you eventually do get the assessment and then you know maybe the picture is or it isn't what you thought but but the assessment's been a while now and we're you know we're dealing with managing this species as in the real world as in time uh, and it's getting kind of old so and and also we're seeing changes in the fishery so i the, the desire is to kind of perhaps adjust our management sooner rather than later. The assessment comes when the assessment comes, but I think you know, part of, I, I'll be optimistic about the assessment uh, being completed on time, but, um, but, but, but maybe it won't, uh, but I, I, that's about all I would add to that. But it's sort of a, there's pluses and minuses to all of this. Um, so it's not a, the perfect solution perhaps, but it's, I think she's, she has stated the case well for it. And, and before, I, again, I definitely want to see some, I, I hope to hear a continued discussion, even though I think we do have a good motion, but as Shanna said, she's putting this up to, to start to focus our discussion. So I guess the intent here is that this, I believe this is going to be very valuable information. And so we're giving ourselves a meeting cycle and hopes that, that or possibly two, that that, that information becomes available 
it, we then have that important motion on what it, it means to start this addendum process, right? Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, I think that sounds good. So go ahead, Lynn. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. So I, I definitely support this motion, and I don't know that this would need to be added, and I, it's probably due to my own um, ignorance, but I wonder if what would also help us to understand as this range is expanding. So as we're leading up to speaking about allocation and moving into a more regional or coastal approach, it might be really helpful to understand what we know about the seasonal movement patterns of these fish. I don't know what we know. I know I just actually looked on the NOAA website and it's a little outdated where it says most of these fish are from Virginia South. Um, but just as we're thinking to, to help us ensure we're not um, setting ourselves up to have a situation where the fish are available to one region or and they all get sucked up before the other gets a chance. So just kind of understanding how these things are moving might also help us in our conversation. Yeah, I, I guess I'll look to staff. Do you feel that that needs to be included in the motion as, as a tasking or? I think we're okay, Len. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, I think it's captured in the record and you're okay, but just while I'm speaking, just not speaking to the pros and cons of the motion, that's up to the board, but just kind of controlling ex expectations. You know, if you were lucky enough to be here during yesterday's straight fast board meeting, we had a lot of conversations about um, staff workloads and other things moving forward. And, and as Chelsea mentioned, she's pinch hitting for Emily on this board right now. So. You know, if, if this board kicks off this um, addendum at the annual meeting, we may not get a whole lot done from the annual meeting to the end of the year, uh, you know, while we're one staff or down. But after that, we can, you know, hit the ground running. And once we're fully staffed and get things, in. I just want to sort of control expectations that we're uh, we've got one valuable staff member that's out for a bit of time. Fair enough. Um, I'm going to go to Jason and then to Shannon. Yeah, just a, a thought on um, kind of the technical committee and, and the team, I, I think it would be valuable to reach out to MRIP uh, to see if they might um, devote some resources. I'm just thinking like Cobia is a classic example of the type of species that MRIP really struggles with, where it's sort of like intermittent, in particular as you get out, um, you know, on the tails of the, of the distribution. So they might have some folks that would have some, um, you know, might be able to help the technical committee develop some tools uh, to account for for that um, for that fact. Because you know, I think you're looking at the de minimis states and their recreational harvest, and and you might be missing uh, information. And so, if, if it's possible, I, I'm just suggesting reaching out to them to see if they could devote some resources to the group. Jason, we can definitely do that. And I don't know how many people actually remember, but the South Atlantic Council um, had reached out to MRIP staff prior to the pandemic on issues that we had been seeing in, uh, with pulse related fisheries um, and sort of how to best utilize the data. How could we improve the use, improve the data itself. Um, and some workshops were happening and then the pandemic occurred. And I think that kind of teetered off, John may remember a little bit more. So maybe in that we can try to reinvigorate some of those discussions that we've been having with MREP to help us better utilize the data and perhaps find additional ways to get more data for this species um, to help us solve our problems. Um, and Lynn, I think maybe what we can do in terms of the seasonal patterns, because I'm not sure we'll have a lot of updated information, but look at state survey data as well. I recognize that in the north there's not going to be surveys dedicated to cobia, but maybe um, just where we're seeing, um, seeing them, it might be helpful to the TC. Yeah, go ahead, Angela. Yeah, I was just going to add to that, you know, the TC did start some of these discussions, and I think there definitely was an interest in looking at various tagging data sets. Um, with the last stock assessment, there was the whole stock delineation discussion, but at that time, even some of the 
states had projects that were ongoing and I think some of those are further along now. Um, I know specifically South Carolina, Virginia. Um, so I know I personally recommended at that time, nothing as intensive as the stock ID workshops, but you know, at least looking minimally at like where fish are being recaptured, what times of year and trying to get at that expansion versus shift discussion. Okay, thank you. Um, back to the table, further discussion on the motion? <laughs> Go ahead. Just really quickly, um, to Bob's point, um, I did just want to say that's kind of the reason why I put the flexibility in there for the TC to ensure that there's, I do not want to add to uh, their already very large workload. So that's why I put that uh, flexibility in there. But also with conversations with Tony earlier, there was some concern about implementation for 2025 if we didn't have enough time at the end of uh, 2024 to actually um, decide what new management measures would look like underneath a different allocation scheme. So just wanted to give some flexibility there to help them work backwards and see what the best determination of timeline would be for them. So that was my intent there. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just, I, I think it's probably a safe assumption that we'll, we would get an update whether or not if it wasn't going to make the annual meeting that we, we believe that we would make it by the next meeting cycle yeah so i think i think that's as, as fair as we can be on this and um because of the nature of this particular data i i have confidence that we can do it in at least two meeting cycles and i think if, i think there's other staff other than just say smc that can be leaned on to help with that so i think that was a healthy discussion and we know that we've we've got a um you know, another meeting where we're really going to craft what this means to start this process. So with that, I'd, I'd like to ask if there's any objections to the motion. If not, um, do I need to read it in again, Tony? Or? Okay. Okay. And the motion carries by, by unanimous consent then. Thanks. I think that's it for COVID. Okay. Okay. So oh, go ahead, Jen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, but wait, there's more on Cobia. Um, <laughs> so after having this discussion, um, I did want to uh, pitch an idea to the board um, that I had regarding um, our upcoming uh, 2024 uh, management measures. Um, so with the idea that we would be putting in place a new allocation um, design by 2025, potentially getting some changes uh, via a stock assessment in 2026 uh, or 2027. Um, I did want to have a discussion at the board, and I don't think that it's necessarily appropriate for this time, so I'm going to task the TC with one more thing, but I do think it kind of rolls into um, what they're currently working on. I'd like the TC to look into um, whether or not uh, making changes to 2024 management measures um, is warranted or if we could potentially stay status quo with those 2024 management measures. My intent here is to try to provide some amount of buffer from management whiplash. Um, I think we could be seeing some considerable changes coming down the pipe for the 2024 fishing year based off of soft targets that we know um, are frankly uh, using a lot of imputed data for especially 2021. Um, and I would like to see if the COBIA TC can see if um, it might be warranted for us to stay status quo coastwide recreationally. So that's my motion there up on the screen. Um, and it is to move to task the COBIA TC with determining the impacts of status quo coastwide recreational management measures for the 2024 fishing year. Um, and I can speak more to that if I get a second and if people want to hear me talk anymore, they're tired of me. <laughs> well, I, I think one thing I'm going to ask before I ask for a second is just the, the timing of this. I'm curious, um, you know, when this would, uh, when the work would get done and when it would come back before the board. So the TC will be meeting um, between now and the annual meeting to evaluate the, the recreational harvest and determine if any states, which we know ahead of time that Virginia does meet the requirement to make changes to their 
their regulations. So they can do that as they are um, looking at regs for 2024 already. And they would bring that back to the October meeting we had already planned on having this board meet again in October. And, and, and Shanna, I apologize for, for letting this hang out there for a bit, I, um, but I, I, staff was aware. And so there, we do have some stuff that may help uh, help inform the board on this. So if we can if we can go through that, and then we'll we'll pick up the motion. I, my apologies for I, I I forgot that we had discussed this. Yep. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. Um. So for to what Tony was just speaking about that we will be setting specifications in October because a new total harvest quota was set this year. So the way that the technical committee goes about looking at that, and this is just for everyone's information, is the technical committee will look at non-de minimis state landings and evaluate them against their harvest targets. If average recreational landings exceed the harvest target, so in this case, it'll be for the past three years, states must restrict their measures to meet the targets. However, if the recreational landings are below harvest targets for two consecutive years, then states may liberalize their measures or keep them as status quo, whichever one they choose to do. And I believe for this specification cycle, most states fall in the liberalization or status quo range, and Virginia falls in that reduction range right now. So the TC, again, as Tony stated, will be going through all of this information probably in early to mid-September um, to make these recommendations on how and if measures change for each state. And then the board will vote on those in October. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I, and I apologize. It was, I was personally unclear on, on exactly the need for this myself. So we we are scheduled to meet on on this, and and you have a very specific task that you would like the TC to look at. So now, with my apologies, is there a second to uh, Virginia's motion? Second by Lynn Fagan. Okay. Discussion on the motion. Okay. Any opposition to the motion? Great. Motion accepted by unanimous consent. Motion carries. I'm sorry. So now the other. Problem species. <laughs> okay, moving into Spanish macro. Um, you know, the board has been trying to, um, I guess, stay in step, but take take the lead from the South Atlantic Council. We have John Carmichael, the executive director, with us. <clears throat> he just so happens to have some pretty good chops in stock assessment work, and so uh, we've asked John to help us through um, what was going on with a, a very interesting stock assessment situation and and then kind of just uh, where the council is at so um go ahead all right thanks joe yeah apparently spanish is a hot potato nobody wants to come talk about it so i appreciate y'all allowing me to pretend to be a stock assessment person once in a while so that's great so next slide just a little review we talked about this back in november gave y'all an update um what we're dealing with here is cdr 78 it was an operational assessment had data through 2020 the prior assessment was CDAR 28 that had data through 2011. So we added nine years of data, updated the recreational with the FES estimates. Um, concerns with MRIP spikes in the shore mode, which probably doesn't surprise anybody here. Uh, another big change was a shorten the time series with year one being 1986. Uh, used to go back, I think, into the 50s and 28. Um, abandoned sex specific growth and updated growth parameters for the natural mortality. Um, Next slide. So this came to the SSC initially in August of 2022. And despite the few things that were done, the SSC had a lot of concerns with that assessment. Um, reported on them, as I said, back in November as well. Um, they provided the initial peer review, requested revisions. There was discussion at the September council meeting about doing some things. The Science Center and Agency offered to do some revised MRIP estimates. Those came to the SSC at their October meeting. Uh, I, I would say the, the short answer is the revised MRIP estimates probably created more questions than answers, um, starting with there was no real clear pattern to years that went up, years that went down, et cetera. Again, a lot of questions with what's going on with expansions of shore mode landings. 
the SSC then convened a working group to try and come up with a more comprehensive plan for addressing the remaining concerns, working with the Science Center. Uh, the working group met and uh, reported to the SSC in a meeting in January 2023. At that time, they came up with terms of reference for doing additional assessment runs, hopefully to address the concerns that they had with the stock assessment. They requested additional analyses be conducted by the Science Center. Um, at the March Council meeting, the Science Center reported that they weren't going to do any more runs, and they recommended that the SSC use the information that they had, and they suggested that the SSC's discussion of considering some data-limited approaches would not be met with a positive uh, determination toward the best scientific information available for Spanish. So that led the council to really take a hard stance with the SSC and say, look, this is this has gone on a long time. This assessment has been delayed because of government shutdowns going back as far as 2019. It's been delayed for COVID. We've had this extensive review. We need an answer. We need the SSC to give us a recommendation for catch levels on this stock. And, and part of it is rep recognizing the urgency at this board to get some progress on uh, Spanish mackerel. So that information went to the SSC at their April 2023 meeting. They were informed no new runs were going to be available, and they essentially made SSC uh, ABC recommendations based on equilibrium conditions as estimated for the stock. And they weren't really fully satisfied with those because they really believe that a that the natural mortality is misspecified and, and that would tend to bias the productivity measures low. So ultimately they decided what they recommended is conservative. It's based on equilibrium conditions. They don't have a lot of confidence in the stock projections or the assessment overall. And then the last step was just last week where they got the full suite of values for those equilibrium conditions and were able to put together the full catch recommendations to go to the council. So next slide, just highlighting here the different concerns the SSC has raised with this assessment. Um, concerns with the age comps, are they all accounted for in the assessment for all sectors, of particularly some of the commercial fisheries? Um, regional differences in how the fishery is prosecuted, which I think are certainly exacerbated by the shifting of the stock farther north, which seems to be happening, and certainly with more frequency of summertime excursions of Spanish mackerel well up the coast. Lack of adequate sample sizes across those sectors, it came to light that the assessment possibly did not include all of the age comp and other information that could be available from some of the states north of the southeast region, which was kind of under, underpinning my comments regarding COBE about how important it is to get the folks who are collecting that data and using that data engaged in these stock assessment processes. The recreational catch increase in 2020, the COVID year, was of a lot of concern. As it is for many species, people had time, they went fishing, the estimates went up on a lot of stuff. How reliable is that? Sampling wasn't as good as it should be, et cetera. And, and while the PSCs are good, suggesting you know reliable data coming out of this for Spanish, the SSC raised concerns that those PSCs could be biased just because of the nature of the fishery and the seasonality, et cetera. They're concerned about the natural, the, uh, excuse me, yeah, the natural mortality is fixed at the CDR 28 value. They think that that's actually uh, too low and that could affect the productivity of the stock. They question the max age, they question the approach that was used because CDR 28, again, as I said, goes back a number of years, had data through 2011 and a lot has happened as far as estimating natural mortality. That is it's kind of one of their biggest concerns that they think leads to bias in the results. The other one is, of course, steepness, also fixed at the CDR 28 value. There's no apparent stock recruitment relationship, just a cloud of, stock, of points really well out onto the right-hand side of the graph, nothing at low stock sizes that we've been seeing. Um, feel like steepness estimates from similar species are not really available. So we have the classic conundrum of don't really have a good measure of productivity or a good measure of natural mortality. The projections are not really considered robust. Uh, influenced by that uncertain date in the terminal year, 2020, the COVID year, really important, at least in, in my interpretation of this, is there was no juvenile survey done in that year. And we're talking about a stock that depends a lot of times on recruitment. Without having that juvenile survey data, the model had no information on 2020 recruitment, but catch went up. So if you've got not much information on the stock abundance and you've got an increase in a catch, a model moving beyond its terminal year had no choice but to say, wow, fishing mortality was high. The projections essentially, I detailed this in 
quite a bit back in November, but the assessment projections essentially predicted a stock that was going to be at all time low abundance in 2022. I don't think any of us have seen that in any of the fisheries up and down the coast. The stock seems to be doing great. All measures are the populations well. The fish are out there, they're available. So projections suggesting a complete collapse of the stock over three years, just really not at all reasonable and the SOC recognized that. So next slide. So I mentioned in March 2023, we're informed no further assessment work in a memo from the Science Center. This is what they told the council regarding Spanish mackerel, which then led the council to tell the SSC, we need to give you catch levels. We're not getting any more runs. This has been going on for almost a year. So that'll bring us to the next slide. The SSC did do as the council requested. Um, they expressed strong dissatisfaction with the lack of any new model runs. I'm very concerned with the information that they were forced to make catch level recommendations on and frustrated that the Science Center was not willing to do some additional runs. And to point out that they, they raised a number of issues. They got some sensitivities on MRIP, but not presented as viable alternatives. There was a sensitivity with higher natural mortality, which when they discussed it in April was also said, well, that's not really a run you can pick as a base run. It's not been fully vetted. It's not had all the, the uh, uncertainty work done on it, et cetera. So they really weren't faced after nearly a year with any viable alternative runs that they could select. They did not support the stock projections, as I said. They did conclude that the base model was adequate for determining stock status and that it gave strong evidence the stock is neither overfished nor overfishing. That then gave them confidence in providing catch levels based on the equilibrium conditions. And that's what they recommended their ABC on based on the equilibrium yield at 75% FMSY. And as I said, in their July 27 meeting, they got the full values. So next slide, I'll just hit a few things to remind folks of how the population is doing. The first is the landings and numbers. Um, in general, other than that far right bar in 2020, where you see the pink recreational catch driven up so high, it's been fairly flat. Uh, you see some decline of the green, which is the commercial gill net, and maybe some increase in some years of the recreational. But overall, there's not been a lot of trend in this fishery. It's been very stable. We do see down there at the bottom a little increase in the commercial hand lines in recent years, which is also commiserate with the gill net landings declining. So next slide, how's the population been doing? Well, the orange is the SSB stock amount. And as you can see, that's really varied without any trend whatsoever from 85 to 2020. And generally, most years stayed above the MSY levels and then all years stayed above the minimum stock size threshold. So never overfished during this time period. The blue is the fishing mortality rates, um, generally below the FMSY level. Um, maybe again in that troublesome 2020 where the model doesn't have full data, it was thinking that that high catch in the recreational fishery in particular represented high fishing mortality. I, I don't think in hindsight now that's going to be the case, and certainly in the next update, I wouldn't imagine that that, that high number would uh, hold water. But in general, you can see fishing mortality has been below FMSY levels over the entire time series. So the stock's been very stable. The other thing you probably notice, uh, certainly those that have done some stock assessment work is there is no contrast in this time series whatsoever. This is why it's difficult to get a stock recruitment relationship because if you've never seen your stock at low SSB, you don't know what your stock's gonna do at low SSB. Now you go back before 1985, there was a much higher commercial fishery, there were much higher landings and there was some, some indication of lower SSB occurred at that time, but even in that model, they had difficulties estimating steepness so it wasn't enough contrast and enough information to solve those problems. And then the next slide is the phase plot of the stock status, the point estimate being the intersection of the green bars. And as you can see, most all the runs show not over fish, not over fishing and well into the safe zone. So, so the bottom line is the stock has been doing very well. The SSC feels uh, that the equilibrium recommendation of ABC is conservative because of the issues with the natural mortality that they raised and just looking at the performance of the stock. So that's what the council will be working with. And the next slide shows the table, the reference points and ABC values. Um, this is the complete table that gives us the, the F values and the biomass and the SSB, et cetera. 
So the FMSY, in our world, the FMSY would be where we get things like OFL and our limits, and then the 75% FMSY, that would be our optimum yield and where we get the ABC. So next slide, I'll highlight what those numbers are. So the overfishing level would be the equi equilibrium yield at fishing at the FMSY level, and that's uh, 8 million pounds in whole weight. The ABC is the equilibrium yield fishing at 75% of that, um, and that would be just a little above 8 million pounds. And these would be constant values in place until the next assessment is done. So I'll look into these in some more detail in the next slide. And this is preliminary information on how the allocations and such would work out and, and comparing the ABCs now to uh, these new estimates we just got from the SSC. This is preliminary, we'll go to the council at our September meeting, but um, this is what will be in the document for them. So the current situation, the ABC is set equal to the MSY. It was the MSY stock productivity estimated in CDAR 28. That is currently at 6 million pounds. So the MSY went up quite a bit in this new assessment from 6 million pounds to 8.2 million pounds. Part of that, a lot of that is the increase in the FES, increased productivity in the stock, increased landings over the time period um, indicates to the model that there were more fish out there. So MSY has gone up. The ABC now is at 6 million pounds. The new, even with dropping back from the MSY level to the OY, 75% of that level, is 8 million pounds. So there is still an increase of about 2 million pounds expected for the stock. This is allocated 55% commercial, 45% recreational, and those values go back to a time um, before we were setting allocations based on historic time periods and looking at commercial and recreational uh, data back in the 90s. Um, so they're not subject to some of the issues with shifting to FES that we've dealt with with other council species where the allocations are tied to a breakout of landings and when the data changed, that's triggered us doing full amendments to deal with those allocation changes. We're not in that situation with Spanish, which will come up when we talk about next steps. But how this breaks out is to a commercial catch level of 4.4 million pounds or recreational 3.6. So 1.1 million bump up in the commercial and about a 9 million, 900,000 bump up in the recreational. So that should be a good thing in terms of staying below limits, et cetera. Um, certainly overall, um, these fisheries have not been exceeding their limits for the most part in recent years. So you can see in the, the landings values for 2022, 23, and 21, 22. Remember, this is on a fishing year, so they're not calendar year landings that we deal with here. But the overall commercial, uh, 21, 22 is pretty high. Uh, would be above even the um, above the old ACL, but not above the new value that we're talking about of 4.4. And the recreational also is similar. So there's there's some good news there, but it may look a little bit different to this group when we talk about the commercial in the northern and southern zones, which is the next slide. So the northern and the commercial fishery is split up into two zones in the South Atlantic, the northern and southern. The northern gets 20%, the southern gets 80%. So the current quota for the northern section is 662. It would go to 882,000 pounds, which is an increase. But if you look down to the landings in both 22, 23, and 21, 22, our last fishing years, uh, the northern zone ex came really close to that in 22, 23, which means it exceeded its allocation at that time and well exceeded it in 21, 22. On the other hand, the southern zone has stayed below. And that's been the story that this board has talked about certainly for a number of years. It's one of the, been the driving forces behind looking at this assessment, the realization that something's going on with this stock. The southern zone has not been landing its full allocation. The northern zone has been repeatedly going over. Thankfully, we've stayed generally within the overall harvest level for the stock and not have gotten into overfished, overfishing type problems with it. But there certainly is an issue with the northern zone that is underlying a lot of the interest in this stock assessment. And so the next steps for the next slide. What's the council planning on doing? First step is to develop a framework amendment to just simply update the catch levels. Now, back when we started in, in this assessment and hoped that we were going to get it 
uh, probably a year or two earlier than we actually received it. The plan wasn't really to do a framework. The plan was to look at many things within this uh, fishery and do a full amendment. But given where we are now and the delays in getting ABCs out of this assessment, the delays that were involved in getting this assessment completed, Council feels the need to do a framework amendment to update the catch levels. So we get them in the currency of the FES, we get those higher catch levels in place as soon as possible. So this would be an interim action as it's being considered to incorporate that FES and get those catch levels in there. Importantly, it will not revise the sector or the regional allocations that will require a full plan amendment. Um, the council prefers to also get the port meeting input, which I'll talk about first, to hear from the fishermen about you know, how we go about making those changes, um, particularly if we're gonna consider shifting that northern southern commercial allocation. And as I said, is we can do this through a framework because those allocations are not based on the historic time series. The other step will be to request a benchmark assessment ASAP, uh, likely for 2026. Council will talk about this in September and we wanna present it to the CDAR steering committee when they meet uh, late September, or early October. So we wanna get this on the schedule quickly. The SSC had a lot of concerns. They were not addressed, they're not gonna go away. The council is gonna conduct what we're calling port meetings in 2024. This is get a lot of input from the fishermen and we wanna cover the full range of this fishery, both you know, traditionally and where it seems to be expanding. And using that develop then next a comprehensive amendment to would address the fisheries issues. So the framework should get started with options and hopefully approval for scoping at our September meeting. And it'll be done in about a year. Hope to have approval of that for December, 2025. Court meetings would take place uh, during most of 2024 and then begin informing the full amendment, which would hopefully be approved uh, about six to eight meetings or so to actually um, get that done for the council getting that work. So maybe 2026 or something to get that part completed. Yeah, or if not sometime sooner, but it will take a while. No, let's see. Yeah, so we get the final of that in September 2024 and approval in 25. So it's gonna be a while before we can actually go through the port meetings and then do a full amendment. And the concern about the full amendment too is, you know, if we get started on that in late 2024, if this becomes tied up in allocations, if the area allocation for the commercial zone becomes really complicated, then we could end up in a situation where it takes longer than planned. Allocations are always prone to that. So council's kind of aware of it, but we have put both the framework and the comprehensive amendment on our work schedule and the council is committed to getting that done. Um, you know, I recognize the timing is probably not ideal for dealing with the Northern zone issues that are most important to this group, but um, you know, at least this does get us some higher catch levels into the fishery sooner rather than later. And then the last piece I was gonna hit on is the next slide with the port meetings. And the focus species on these will be king and Spanish mackerel. The idea is to go out and meet multiple places in each state, somewhat informally with fishermen and just gather their feedback, not with any specific management actions on the table, but rather to hear their concerns and what they would like to see out of the fishery in the future. It's gonna be open to all members of the public, you know, all sectors of the fishery and others that want to come and give their feedback. Um, looking at communities through the Gulf of Mexico and up the Atlantic coast. And just a reminder for us, this is a joint plan with the Gulf of Mexico Council. So we have to do things in coordination with them. And we've worked with the Gulfs, reached out to them about doing the port meetings. They are not necessarily, interested in doing things as thoroughly as we are. They may do some, some virtual things and some interaction with their uh, fishermen, but we expect from Florida and northward will be the more intensive effort toward these port meetings. And then what we're asking of the commission in support of this is staff participation on the planning team so we can make sure we identify your constituents and the appropriate places to go and, and have your people help us with uh, developing the process and the messaging help with the outreach so we can spread the word appropriately throughout your region. And I'll point out we're doing the same and working with both the Mid-Atlantic Council and the New England Council to reach their folks as well. And then hopefully staff and commission member participation at the actual meetings, because it's good for your constituents to see your staff. And again, we're doing the same with the Mid-Atlantic and New England. And 
in a lot of ways, I think this is a, a stock that may be a bit of a poster child for how we all together, all of us on the Atlantic coast, three councils and a commission, deal with these species that appear to be shifting their distributions, call the cause whatever you want, but the ocean's getting hotter and fish are responding, and we're gonna have to find ways of dealing with it. And I, I think this could be a really good way of showing, say, the agency that, you know, we as councils and a commission can work together and solve these problems in our own ways, and we don't need maybe a whole lot of uh, governance guidance and hardcore federal policies about how we go about doing it. So with that, that's the conclusion of the presentation, and I'm sure there's some questions. Do you, do you want to break up assessment? Yeah, I think so. I think that would be good. We talk about the assessment, and then we can hit on the port meeting stuff. Yeah, let's do that. Let's let's focus on the any assessments on <laughs> any questions on the assessment, and then we'll talk about uh, management between the the amendment process and the and the port meeting. So, questions on the assessment for John? Go ahead, then. I don't. Well, thank you, John, very much for that, and and really thank you because I don't really have questions so much as a comment in, in that I think we just got good news. So thank you for that. <laughs> Feels pretty good. Jason. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, just, you know, I'm not super familiar with this species. And, and so I'm just kind of looking at those efforts in the context of the other fish that I think about. They're super high. So is it, I mean, is it like a, a super productive species that can kind of withstand high levels of, of fishing mortality? Or is there something you know you you talked about kind of the um natural mortality discussion I'll, I'll call it that was had and is there maybe like some sort of trade-off going on um there within the mechanics of the assessment yeah it's a it's a live fast kind of species you know they don't live particularly long i think the so it goes out to 10 in terms of the age comp but most of the population is quite a bit younger. They mature pretty quick. They spawn a lot. They're, you know, they're a, they're a volatile species. They kind of always have been. That's been the story of them the whole time that we've been dealing with them. I think at one point the generation time was, I don't know, like four or five years. You know, we we've done assessments where we felt like two or three generations have come through the stock before we've updated it. So yeah, they they do seem to sustain a pretty high fishing mortality rate and. Have have done pretty well under that. Other questions? <clears throat> okay, moving on from <clears throat> from where we are with the assessment update. Any questions on just the the management mm -hmm. focus? Now um, we have a, a, a framework that's going to get us through our needs, and then um, the longer process with, and and the port meetings to get us through the, the future of the species management. So questions there, or Chris, go ahead, and then Shannon. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, John, for walking us through the next steps and answered some, quite a few of my questions. Uh, I guess I'll start with the port meetings. You mentioned they're gonna occur in 2024. Uh, what, what's the anticipated end time for those port meetings kind of getting through the entire Atlantic coast? I, you might've mentioned that, but I might've missed it. So we've got a year plotted out for those. We hope to potentially be intensive into the planning and such going into our, you know, this fall and have them lined up, maybe even do some this fall and, and over the winter when the fishermen aren't as active and then hopefully wrapping it up with reports to the council by our June meeting of next year. So June of 24, and then that would trigger us with having options and potential scoping approval for the full amendment happening at our September 2024 meeting. So really over the course between now and the next year, we hope to get out there, get those set up, get them done, and then have the feedback ready to start making its way into actual, you know, suite of management things that council might want to consider. Thank you. I, pre I appreciate that. Um, and you mentioned kind of a rough amendment timeline for when the, the council um, move, moves on to that. And you, know, you discussed you know, the challenges anytime you have allocation involved in an amendment, it could uh, extend the process. Uh, is this 
kind of rough timeline you um, you you talked about is that also accounting for I guess a lot of the other actions that the council is working on? There's a lot of you know snapper grouper uh, amendments to deal with uh, you know the those stock statuses. Is there a chance that you know some of those actions might also impact the timing of the Spanish mackerel amendment? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, we've basically penciled in this amendment to, they said, begin September 24, wrap up, be approved maybe by December 25 or March 26. So six, seven meetings, hopefully. And it is a priority. I think this is going to be a priority for the council going through 24 and 25. I'd say this and then dealing with uh, Red Snapper on the Snapper Grouper front will be the top priorities, but we are finally getting into a bit of a lull in terms of stock assessments for snapper river species coming at us. So yeah, I'm pretty optimistic the council is going to stick with this, and there's a lot of interest at the council as well in dealing with these with this fishery. You know, we we try to remind folks that um, we have three big fin fisheries in the South Atlantic: dolphin wahoo, king Spanish, and snapper grouper. And in terms of overall landings, they're all about equal. So, you know, it, it's it's time that the council did spend some time on Spanish and they are committed to doing that for sure. So I think that they're going to make the commitment to keep this project on track. Let's go to Shanna and then Spud. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you very much again, Dr. Carmichael. Um, it's always a pleasure having you here. You run through um, our stock assessments so clearly and well, like I, I really, really appreciate it. Um, and, and to that end, my question is, uh, kind of along the lines of what Chris is, a little bit of process. So I'm not sure if this is for you or maybe for ASMFC staff, but um, and just thinking about these port meetings and kind of, uh, they feel like almost pre-scoping, right? We're kind of going out and talking to some of our um, constituents and, and seeing what they're seeing. Um, is there any kind of thought to maybe utilizing the newly formed uh, Spanish mackerel TC maybe to kind of help us get to that and um, maybe provide a little bit of assistance and backup? Because it looks like you're asking for ASMSC staff participation. Um, maybe our TCs could also help support our ASMSC staff in trying to lead them in the right direction of where we could meet, who we can talk to, setting up that sort of things, et cetera. Just trying to utilize those guys a little bit more so that we're not just um, pinging on our ASMFC staff as well. Like we're, we're happy to help here at the States. <laughs> I mean, that's good to hear. And your characterization of that is pretty accurate. These are in a way kind of pre-scoping and the reason they're being termed differently is, and, and I imagine you guys have the same problem with us. You do scoping and you're on a particular set of actions and that's what you're there to talk about. And you don't always get people. We just did one last week on electronic log books. Nobody showed up, you know, and, and that's kind of a common thing when it comes to scoping because, you know, people aren't really mad about the issue. Nobody comes out and talks about it. So we're hoping of presenting these differently to the fishermen is saying, this isn't where we're gonna say, you know, we're here to talk about these issues. I don't wanna hear about those other issues. This is to go to them and say, here's the chance for you to tell us about all the issues you care about. Because so often in hearings and scopings, oh, you don't wanna hear about this issue, right? So we're gonna tell them now's your chance. And our vision of it would very much align with having the state experts, having the TC members, show up when it's in their neighborhood and, and in their state because you know i think that's really important and we certainly feel that's important to the constituents that they kind of see all of us fisheries professionals that are involved in it and that it's not just you know folks from the south atlantic council that are coming up here but we rely so heavily on the state expertise for everything that we do that you know we really feel it's great to have the whole community from the area that's there. You know, if we do one in, in Moorhead City, it would probably be a likely case for us in North Carolina. You know, we want we want Chris there, we want Trish there, we want your biologist there as well. The same, you know, if we do one up around Norfolk or something, it'd be great to have you guys. And as we go up the coast, we really want to try to get, you know, as many of the professionals there. So in some cases, it's a friendly face. Maybe that helps pull the comments out of people. Maybe it, it helps uh, keep things cool if people get excited. So for all of those reasons, yeah, we would love to have as many people come and help support this as we can. Go to Spud and then Erica. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate what John said. As a city member of the South Atlantic Council, we are definitely going to keep this at the top of our priority list. Um, 
you know, I think there was a lot of frustration with the results of the assessment. You know, the SSC did the best they could to pull a rabbit out of a hat on this one and, and actually give us something to work with. But, you know, I know there's concerns about the delays associated with having the port meetings, but given the fact that we're going to be considering allocation in a very different climate than what we've ever considered it in before, um, we believe the investment of time and effort is certainly going to be not only beneficial to the council, but very beneficial to the commission because we're going to have to reconcile some of these long-standing issues we've had between interstate fisheries management and federal fisheries management. And our, our greatest chance of success in doing that is to be as best informed as we can about present and future needs um, because this one really is kind of like COVID. They're, they're going to they're gonna be the test of can we really put climate ready fisheries as NOAA says into practice because it's one thing to talk about it it's another thing to actually make it happen so thank you thank you mr chair and john thanks for being here at spanish mackerel is a very important fishery for florida it happens to overlap locationally with our king mackerel commercial fishermen and on the east coast and years ago the king mackerel commercial fishermen organized their own port meeting they called me to attend, and it was the best public meeting I've ever attended, the most information. So I'm really excited that you guys are using this format and knowing the macro fishermen, they're a different group and they've got a lot of ideas. And I know Chris has heard North Carolina, there's a lot of ideas for making wholesale shifts in how this fishery is managed. In Florida, we're facing something that we couldn't have um, predicted when this FMP was last modified, and that was losing access to Spanish mackerel fishing grounds. One of the reasons why our landings are down in the south, in the southern zone, is because um, space launches are closing access to fishing grounds, where we've got large area closures where all commercial and recreational fishermen are prohibited from entering. And um, so, the, the dip in landings is not a change in effort, it's it's lost access. So I feel like we're finally getting your wind development problems. We're feeling it down south. So um, I just wanna encourage us, Florida will support you throughout uh, the coast on this as both an ASMFC rep and, and council representative. Um, but I think it's gonna be great to hear new ideas coming from the fishermen into this fishery, especially as it's expanding north. And, and I think you've got a lot of new participants who can add value to management. Thanks. Thanks, I'm, and I'm, I'm almost gonna kick myself for asking this, but are, are we still, do we still have an issue with the species where we're misaligned between the federal and the state plans on our zones? And I'm just wondering how that does that impact anything? Does that create a situation where the board's gonna have to make some changes to the state plan? I think that the definition of the zones is different between the two plans, is that right? Okay. Um, that is correct. If you give me one moment here, I can pull up exactly what that difference is. Um, and Bob may be able to speak to this better than I can, but I think that to address those differences previously, this board has decided to wait until the South Atlantic Council was going to take action, knowing that they would be taking action. Um, but, you know, someone can correct me there if I'm wrong, but I'll pull up that uh, zone difference right now. Here it is. So in the federal plan, the northern zone is New York to North Carolina, and the southern zone is South Carolina to Florida down the east coast of Florida. And then in the interstate FMP, the northern zone is New York to Georgia, and the southern zone is just the east coast of Florida. Yeah, and we have we have some challenges ahead. We saw them coming. We we formed a TC for this group, and I think we have some ideas around the table. So uh, I'll go to Chris Batsavage. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, th these are issues that we've talked about with our with the ASMSC FMP for a few years now at least and uh, it's good to see we finally had some resolution as far as the Spanish macro stock assessment and now the South Atlantic Council can at least start moving forward with uh, with updating you know the, the ACLs uh, you know, we have the port meetings coming up and uh, and eventually an amendment um, 
uh, for for the uh, for the federal FMP. Um, yeah, and yeah, we've yeah, so we're we've been pretty patient. I think uh, you know we, we still need to show some patience. So you know, you initiated an action to fix some of these issues that we know exist in the in the ASMC plan is a little premature. Uh, but at the last meeting, um, I think one thing we discussed besides forming uh, a TC for Spanish mackerel is uh, getting a better idea of. What these, what the fishery is like, uh, you know, especially uh, along this uh, this this northern range, and and the port meetings will get to that to uh, to a, a, a large level from talking to stakeholders. Uh, but I think there might be some other ways to you know better characterize the uh, the Spanish mackerel fisheries along the Atlantic coast. So I have a motion I'd like to. Um, uh, uh, introduced for the, the the board's consideration. Uh, let's wait for it to go up on the uh, the screen. Okay, it looks like that's it. Um, so, uh, move to direct the Spanish Mackerel Technical Committee to develop a paper that characterizes the recreational and commercial Spanish mackerel fisheries along the Atlantic coast. The timing and content of the paper are intended to help the Coastal Plastics Management Board address state waters management issues. And if I get a second, I'll elaborate a little more on that. Shannon, are you second? Okay, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, so some of the discussions back in November was, you know, just you know, who, who's catching these fish, where, um, you know, timing, state waters, federal waters, uh, things like that. I think that would be, uh, a good good for the board to to have uh, at their disposal, um, even while the port meetings are, are underway. We're going to get that good kind of detailed information from the fishermen as far as their fishing practices and other anecdotal information that isn't captured in the data. But I think there's a lot of data out there already um, in terms of what gears are landing the fish, the amount of effort. Um, like I said the state waters, federal waters uh, difference. Um, and yeah, I, I think I would leave it to the TC to kind of look at what the available data is to determine whether this should be done at a state level or maybe a regional level, especially as you head further north. Um, but but to have this uh, information available, um, you know, when you know we kind of we're all, I guess both both groups are are kind of at, at a point where we're you know thinking about what to do as far as management goes. Uh, this might be an opportunity for. For ASMFC to or the the board to look at some state waters uh, specific uh, management that we've already discussed that needs to be fixed in our FMP uh, that could complement the, uh, the the federal FMP uh, and and not you know cause any uh, contradictions and things like that. Just trying to divide up uh, the, the the duties a bit, um, you know, kind of in, in light of the, the the comments about you know a climate ready fishery, especially as these things uh, move around in places that we haven't seen before. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And I think Chris covered it really, really well. Um, again, kind of my comments to and questions to Dr. Carmichael were trying our best to make sure that we're getting our newly formed TC kind of involved. I think that uh, the port meetings are going to be um, an excellent time for us to get a handle on what some of our fishermen are seeing out there. I know that I've got staff already emailing me saying, hey, I know exactly who you're going to want to talk to because they're tearing them up these past two weeks. So um, I think it's a really important time for us as the states to use our new TC to kind of help support this effort. Um, I think this is exactly what we formed the technical committee to do and what we talked about them doing when we formed the TC. Um, I know that my technical committee staff member has already provided me with some information, I, essentially illustrating the fact that our um, landings are definitely changing over time, how much we're landing after those closures, um, our voluntary, you know, bycatch uh, implementation that we put in place a few years ago. Um, and kind of what's been changing there within the last few years. So I think it's really important for us to kind of get that characterization um, and do that in line step with these port meetings and, and have something for the board to discuss. Thanks. Discussion on the motion. <clears throat> we'll go to Spud and then Erica. Yeah, thank you, Joe. I certainly don't disagree with the intent of the motion. I'm just trying to figure out how this relates to what we received in a July 10th email from uh, 
Emily says, board also tasked staff with compiling a fishery profile with information on each state's Spanish mackerel fisheries and how they are prosecuted, including information on an ordinary end of the management unit to streamline this process. We will request information from each state this year. At the same time, we ask for compliance reports this year due October 1. Staff are currently working on a questionnaire for states to fill out, e.g. number of participants, gear types, average landings per trip, et cetera. If there are questions or topics you would like to see included, please let me know by next Friday, June 30. So is this the same thing or different? Just trying to understand. <laughs> yeah, we certainly did you know, kick this off, but I don't, you know, I'm not sure how much work is done. Chelsea, do you have an update and do you feel that, that what we've started covers everything or, I mean, there's certainly no harm, right? It, since this is tasking the TC and we don't have a hard timeline for them, but, but I, I think it's an important question. You know, how much of this did we get started? Because one of the big things we're talking about is, is staff time and, and the amount of work going into all of this. So not sure if, if Chelsea has an update for us. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I do have an update on that. The um, between the time you know Emily left and I took over, that fishery profile questionnaire has gone out to all the administrative commissioners and the compliance report contacts. So I think that information can be not to double the workload of the plan review team and the technical committee. I think it can be used by both of those teams to get at this question that we're asking here so it would maybe more be a job of the tc to take all that information and turn it into something that is usable um but i can turn to bob if he sees this in a different going in a different direction no i, I think you're exactly right chelsea you know the I guess the, the the encouragement here is for all the states to respond to those questionnaires, and then once we get those in, we can have the TC compile it and um, you know pull that information together and have it essentially you know respond to this motion. Thanks. So did that answer your question? Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, and I think the other thing to point out is there's still, I think if we're going to task the TC with this, it's going to be very important that states have a participant on those TCs. And I know that's always a struggle, you know, because people are spread thin all the time. Um, and it, you know, the same email is uh, making sure that folks avail themselves of the opportunity to nominate TC members. And it did say that it didn't expect that TC to be actually meeting until 2024. So it's just something we need to consider in the timeline here of, of managing expectations. So thank you. Good point, thanks. Erica? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I see a little bit of difference in what was in the email from Emily and the motion that's before the board right now, especially with the discussion that Chris added to it to address state waters management issues. We have made a decision in the past that we would stay in step with the council and not get in front of them. We have issues with with things being different already between the state and federal FMPs. And while I'm, I'm comfortable with that, I think the technical committees looking at the data doesn't really tell the whole picture that the port meetings will add to it. So there's information that you can't tell or read from the data that you get from the fishermen. Um, one example I have is if you, you wouldn't know by looking merely at the data that there are three different components to the commercial fishery in Florida's waters because largely they're the same people and they move from one to another to the next where they're targeting different size, using different gear and at different times. Um, I've also had conversations with fishermen to the north that they're entering the fishery in part because they're losing access to others. And I don't think that the data solely on Spanish mackerel is gonna give you that issue, but if you have a conversation with the fishermen, you get a lot more. So. I, I have an issue with addressing state waters management with the report or paper that might come out of the technical committee. Any further discussion? Seeing none, just making sure, Eric, you're not saying that that's necessarily an objection to the, the tasking, right? Just what comes out of it may be. I have an objection to the motion. Okay. So I'd be happy to make an amendment. Okay. So my amendment would be to strike 
address state waters management issues from the motion. Erica, that look okay? And maybe also modify the word help to be inform as well. Spud needs help. We have a motion. Is there a second? Done. Okay. Motion and a second. Discussion on the motion. Go ahead, Chris. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think the part that uh, the, the amendment is getting to, I think, and the, the whole reason why we're doing this exercise in the first place. Uh, I mean, at a minimum, we know there's some issues in this in the ASMFC plan that need to be addressed. Um, one of the more glaring ones is we the the FMP is silent. This the uh, ASMFC's uh, plan is silent on what to do when the you know, the northern zone ACL is reached. Uh, the way we've uh, you know mitigated kind of that, that loophole is putting in this you know 500 pound trip limit uh, and you know it, I think the I think this board should look at whether or not that's an appropriate response uh, to to when to when the northern zones reach uh, and there's a, a host of other things but also um, you know and it's really up to the board it's not the TC's call it's going to be providing this information is, is there anything else we want to look at I mean I think a, I guess the make a comparison from an FMP standpoint is funny dogfish, you know, where there's, you know, a federal and, and an ASMFC plan and there's certain aspects of management that's handled by ASMFC and there's certain aspects of management that's handled uh, through the, uh, the, the, the council's uh, FMPs and they don't contradict each other. It's just more or less a, uh, you know, separate out the duties uh, uh, based on, on, you know, whether it's more of a, a federal waters issue or a state waters issue. Uh, and that's so that, that's why you know, I'm definitely speaking against this amendment because I think we need kind of have some you know re reason for putting this paper together uh, and I think it's really to help us move forward with uh, you know with the state waters FMP for Spanish mackerel. Further discussion? Well I know the answer to do we need to caucus on the amendment because I do. <laughs> so um, if we don't have further I'm 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 going to take a minute. I'll give everyone, um, how about two minutes since I have to text with my folks? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's time. I, I, does anyone need additional time? All right. So I'm going to call the question on the amended motion. <clears throat> I'll read that again for for us here. Move to amend to strike, address state water management issues, and replace help with inform motion by Erica, second by Doug. All those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. And Tony, if you could look online as well. Please. Uh, Rhode Island, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and New Jersey. Those opposed to the amendment? Delaware, Maryland, a PRC, I couldn't see who it was, uh, Virginia, and North Carolina. Abstentions? South Atlantic Council. No votes. Oh, one more abstention. No fisheries. I have to get my old lady eyes on for that. Five, five, two. So, so the vote is five, five with two abstentions. So the amendment will fail at, for lack of a majority. Back to the main. Any interest in trying to wordsmith? Okay. Looks like we're back to the main. So um uh, again i'm gonna i'm gonna take a second for a caucus so I'll, I'll take a minute for a caucus okay i i think we're ready to go here so i'm gonna call the question on the on the main motion all those in favor rhode island georgia north carolina virginia potomac river fisheries commission maryland delaware south carolina and new jersey I'm not sure if that was everyone. All those opposed? Florida. Abstention? South Atlantic Council, NOAA Fisheries. Okay, that covers us. Oh, go ahead, Spud. Um, it's rare for me to offer an unsolicited opinion, but <clears throat> this is a little frustrating to me that we can sit here as a board and be divided on how best to inform ourselves how to make better decisions. And, and that I think is is an inherent difficulty and it's, and it's symptomatic of why it's going to be so hard to manage these shifting expanding stock fisheries when we 
frustrate ourselves with how are we actually going to give ourselves the information to make better decisions. And with that, I'll conclude, Mr. Chair. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair. So uh, I'm sorry, the, the count again. Right. So this this the vote on the main is is nine in favor, one opposed, two abstentions. So the, the motion carries. Well, I don't know, but in the nearest of near terms, but um, yeah, I mean, I think this is a challenge for our, the reasons that you mentioned earlier as well. You know, um, we're we're being we're going to be talking climate scenario planning, and <laughs> and we're being pulled along in a very strong current with these two species. So it's not surprising um, that we, you know, it, it's going to be a challenge moving forward, and and it's to some extent, you know, uncharted for us. So I I I think that whatever information we get, we'll we'll, we'll be able to use. Um, to help guide us. So, um, I, I, any other business before us? Go ahead, then. Sorry. No, that's okay. I I just want to be clear. So, it, would could this not be used in concert ultimately with the output from the port meetings? I mean, I'm just. I guess I'm not. I mean, I, I'm hoping that we're not going to have this sort of issues. I mean. Clearly, we've we've got some challenges before us, but I also think with this misalignment of plans, this is going to be important. But I'm hoping we're going to be able to use all the information before us ultimately. Erica, did you have something? Correct, and that's why I originally opposed the motion and offered the amendment because the statement around the original motion was that this would be used in advance of the port meetings, and I'd prefer to use all information at once to make decisions. Thank you. Anything else, Bob? I guess I'm just sort of trying to wrap my head around timelines here. You know, the the council essentially list John listed three things that the council is going to work on. They're going to do a framework to adopt OFLs, ACLs, and all the new quotas. Uh, they're going to do port meetings, and then they're going to do a, a allocation amendment, for lack of a better term. And I think the last time this board talked about it, my recollection is that the framework um adjustment to adopt the ofl and other uh, quotas we don't have to do because our plan adopts the federal quotas by default so if if the council and federal government implement those we adopt those by reference so that part we're off the hook the port meetings i think we've agreed to have state commission staff participation and, and work with the councils and and do that i guess so i'm on to the timing of when this board would start working on an amendment and i think our amendment is going to deal with allocation regional allocation sector allocation it's going to have to deal with all these differences between the state and federal plan there's a there's actually quite a few of them when you go through the list there's the recreational season ours is a calendar year the council starts on march 1st we our, our plan lists prohibited gears the federal plan lists allowable gears you know there, there's actually quite a few and uh, other things that uh, chris and others have mentioned so I was envisioning, and I think the last conversation this board had was that we are not going to start an amendment to deal with state water issues until after the port hearings, and we're going to kind of move along in parallel, sort of timing-wise, with the council as they develop allocations. We would kind of tag along with those allocation conversations, and then maybe separately, but through the same document, but through separate conversations, address these state water issues that are that are different between the two plans. Some of them may be different for good reasons. We keep them. Some may, you know, maybe um, increasing consistency will be a good thing. Is that is that a fair characterization of where this board, or the timing of that amendment and the process for that amendment that this board sees moving forward? I just want to make sure when I'm interacting with the council at their meetings, I can understand where this board's going. Yeah, and I think, you know, this this motion doesn't have a timeline in it, and we had that discussion. I think that's certainly intentional, but I see Chris is, uh, would like to add. Yeah, that, thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, you just basically said what I was going to say. That I didn't put a timeline on here for for that main reason. Uh, you know, we, we know we have these port meetings going on. Um, the, the timing of whether you know, when we decide to address state waters management, I guess to be determined. Um, but to, to have this uh, information in addition to the port meetings, uh, I think will will better help or, or inform, depending uh, us uh, as 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 we move along. But uh, but yeah, there there's the, the timing question. I think we'll we'll need to just 
I think that's to be determined um, as 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 we move along with this. Yeah, and I'll just add, I think for some of the northern states where this is still an incidental fishery, it's the, the groundwork that we have started and will continue here is is going to help our our states have that discussion with the South Atlantic on you know who the stakeholders are and the best way to to hold those port meetings. Spud. Yeah, maybe maybe to make I'll I'll offer this maybe to, in, in an attempt that we all are thinking in the same way, and that is that it is the intent of this board to not take any action uh, to define allocation and these various other elements until the South Atlantic Council process yields its product. And so that we are in sync moving forward and we have synchronous implementation of measures to the best we can. It is that the intent of what this board wants to do? And if that, if that, I think that helps everybody's comfort level understand that we're not we're not going to perpetuate this out of sync management by taking, you know, commission activities premature to those those federal activities because I think we all want the actions we take to be durable. To use good old Robert Bull's description, we want them to be durable, and the only way they can be durable is for us to do them when the, all the decisions are made in a way that we don't have to go back and try to correct something that we did prematurely. So if that's the intent, I think that probably increases everybody's comfort level with with where we are, so. Go ahead, Chris. It's hard to predict the future, um, but no, I mean, I, I, I don't think we need to get out ahead of the council and then find out we have to do this twice. Um, but you know, after the port meetings, we get a lot of information from that and the uh, information we're ta we tasked the TC with. I think we're all gonna have a better picture of, of what this fishery looks like and what management might need to look like in the future. Um, yeah, it, this, yeah, and I, yeah, don't wanna, like I said, I don't wanna get out ahead of the council and have something that just doesn't, that just completely misaligns, but I think we might need to take a look at the, those products and then figure out what's the next steps. Um, as far as as far as management and instead of because i don't know if i want to necessarily commit to just having the synchronous pattern we may find out you know, a year from now there's some certain things we can do at the state level and do it pretty quickly and it won't really impact the federal uh, fmp at all um but that that remains to be seen that I, I just like to leave that option open uh, just you know for the sake of efficiency to address some issues that we know have been going on for a long time in state waters just in terms of inconsistency in the plan and stuff changing Thank you, Chris. Well, yeah, we're getting close to time, so I'll take um, general consent with, with Spud's notion. Um, unless anyone else has a hand, I I purposely took over as chair as soon as possible to get out of the other side of this because I know <laughs> the next chairs can have some really serious and uh, tough challenges. Um, no, but with that said, I, I mean, I think what Chris said is fair. And I think actually, uh, looking to something like spiny dogfish, where you have um, kind of a, a different model, um, may be helpful sometime in the future. But I, I think, you know, John, uh, you know, I, we have to do this together to some extent. And so, um, you know, I think and I agree with that general consent that he has. But... Oh, sorry. So that was that was pretty much it, right? So um, unless there's an objection, I will uh, adjourn this meeting. Thank you.